ancient times, the Mediterranean Sea lay at the center of the civilized world. On these shores, out of history's dawn, rose majestic Carthage, the grandeur of Rome, the glory of Greece, the wonders of Egypt. But all that remains of these classic empires is ruin and decay, and the story of their vanished people lives only in history. And yet today, there is one place where the past is still the present. This place is Morocco. Here, in the shadow of the Atlas Mountains, stands Marrakesh, metropolis, marketplace, and gateway to the past. For beyond the mountains lies the Sahara Desert, and deep in this burning waste rise the strange monuments of an ancient culture. These are the tents of the blue men of Morocco. This is how they looked in ages past, and this is how they look today. The blue men are made up of many sub-tribes. This group is typical of all the others. It's composed of several related families. The blue men are blue. Their skins are indelibly stained by the indigo dye used to color their clothing. In the life of a nomad, every day is moving day. And so the tribe owns few worldly possessions and everything is portable. Since the blue men live by a camel economy, care of the livestock is their first concern. Strangely enough, these desert animals are unable to find their own pasture. They need the help of men in order to live. The blue men, in turn, raise and sell camels for their livelihood. This little fellow, however, is still much too young for the camel market. For the next two years, he'll be left in his mother's care. When a camel is born, it has no hump. It's developed by good feeding. This lump of fatty tissue supplies the emergency rations for the long desert journeys. And the market value of a camel is usually determined by the size of its hump. The camel furnishes fresh milk for the blue man and his children. Camel milk can be churned into butter, but since the churn must be carried from camp to camp, the tribe uses a lightweight model made from goat skin. In addition to food, the camel also provides the blue man with his shelter. Here, camel's hair is woven into material for a tent. The desert wanderers carry no hand tools at all. Rocks serve as hammers. And the thorns of the thala bush will do very nicely to hold the tent together. But it's in the camelback kitchen that the ultimate in light housekeeping is reached. For the entire camp, there's only one cooking pot, called the gudra, and one spoon, made of lightweight wood. Today, shisha is being prepared. It's a luxury dish enjoyed only once or twice a week. The ancient recipe calls for one part water and one part barley flour. Oil from the argan nut adds the gourmet's touch and transforms the paste into pastry. It's traditional to serve the men first, and proper etiquette to eat only with the right hand. However, the other may be used to pay left-handed compliments to the cook, who now has her hands full serving the children, who also have their hands full. After dinner, the men relax with their pipes. And since there are no dishes to wash, the women now have time to visit the desert beauty parlor. A feminine fad popular for the last few thousand years is a henna treatment. 
but not for the hair, for the hand. These intricate designs are symbols of good fortune. Drying over a charcoal stove sets the stain, then the excess is removed. Now she'll have nothing but good luck on her hands for many weeks to come. To offset their drab surroundings, the women decorate themselves with amber beads and coral. And silver charms are braided into the hair. While the women folk labor over their elaborate hairdos, the men apply themselves with equal vigor to a game of desert checkers, played with thalathorns and camel dung. But today they go through the motions almost automatically, for no one can think of anything but camels and camel markets. However, the news they've been waiting for is on its way. These four tribesmen are returning with the latest market quotations. This year, the local camel dealers just aren't buying. What's to be done? The tribe can't go another year without selling camels. Money is badly needed for flour, sugar, and tea. And it's over tea that the blue men discuss their serious problem. There's one possible way out of their predicament. They could drive their camels 300 miles north over the Atlas Mountains to the city of the sun, Marrakesh. But who will guide the caravan? No one has ever been to Marrakesh before. Can the camels stand such a long journey? But finally, a decision is made. It's settled. Tomorrow, we start for Marrakesh. In the morning, the camp is up at dawn. Devout Muslims, they face Mecca for the first of five daily prayers. The ritual of cleanliness is observed. But here on the desert, where water is scarce, the ceremony of washing is only symbolic. Now the tents are struck, camp is broken. And as the camels are loaded, they begin their characteristic complaining. Each one, it seems, has heard about the straw that broke the camel's back. If a straw could fracture a fellow's spine, what will a spoon do? Water, most precious of all their possessions, is carried in goatskin canteens. And now it's all aboard. The camel drive to Marrakesh is about to begin. Riding a camel is much like riding a roller coaster. The men graciously yield these precarious perches to the women and children. It's safer and much more comfortable to walk. Burdens are carried by camels over five years old. Younger camels, the ones to be sold at Marrakesh, carry nothing at all. water is sometimes found in these boulder-strewn wastelands, and the stone marker indicates that it may be found here, but only maybe. The blue men are well aware that from one season to the next, water holes will appear only to vanish again.
This time, the thirsty tribesmen find nothing but sand. And digging deeper doesn't help. There is no water here. The caravan must reach an oasis before their scanty water supply is exhausted, even though this means a long, time-consuming detour. Under the desert sun, man can survive no longer than seven hours without water. But no matter how urgent the quest, the caravan can travel only two miles each hour. Then it must stop to rest. Canteens grow empty, careful rationing is vital. Every precaution is taken to prevent spilling a single drop. Contrary to popular belief, the sandy regions form only a seventh part of the desert. But this fraction is so vast, an oasis is only a tiny island in a boundless sea. And so in plotting a course, even a minor error could mean disaster for the caravan. Swept by desert winds, the sands are constantly changing. There are no familiar landmarks. There are only the sun and the stars. the caravan moves ahead. And then, all at once, it's there. Over the next dune, a palm tree, and beyond, the oasis. The greetings are warm and friendly, but most welcome of all is cool, fresh water for parched and burning throats. It's a common misbelief that a camel drinks very little water. Actually, he will consume as much as 20 gallons at a time, enough to last him several days. Unlike the blue men who are footloose nomads, the oasis dwellers rarely leave the wells dug by their forefathers. The size of an oasis is dictated by the number of its wells. But only the imagination limits the ingenious methods used to pump water from them. Here's a self-spilling bucket made from a camel's bladder. Water from the wells is carried through a central canal to the farmer's fields. A professional watermaster rigidly controls the distribution. His primitive water meter is a copper pan with a hole in the bottom. It takes 12 minutes for it to sink. During this time, water flows into a farmer's field. Each 12-minute interval, called a tassa, is tallied by tying a knot in a palm frond and a farmer inherits the number of tosses he receives. When his quota is reached, the watermaster shouts a signal. The farmer closes the canal into his field, and the next farmer has his turn. 
But not all the water is used for irrigation. The laundry must have a share, too. Syncopated laundry mat, the bachelors have a rhythm all their own. The wash day stop. Oasis agriculture, dates are an important product. For centuries, they've been a staple food of the desert dwellers. But to the blue men, dates are a rare treat, and they gorge themselves like kids in a candy shop. Of course, water is the most precious of the Oasis commodities. And now members of the caravan fill their goatskin canteens to overflowing. Rested, refreshed, the blue men move out again on the long march to Marrakesh. The days pass. But eventually, the foothills of the Atlas Mountains are reached, and the caravan begins the long climb. This is a novel experience. It's the first time they've ever left their desert home. High on a barren plateau, they encounter a swarm of locusts. Most people would consider these hungry insects a curse. But to the blue men, they're a blessing straight from heaven, and all join in the strange harvest. A sort of flying shrimp, locusts can be cooked in several ways, but boiling is the easiest and quickest. Since the tribe has only one wooden bowl, everything is served family style. The wings and legs are considered indigestible, but you'll find all the rest toothsome and tasty. That is, after you've acquired the taste. Through this high country roam the goat herds of the Berber tribes. But food is so scarce, the goats do most of their grazing in the trees. Goat herding here is something like bird watching. Of course, a shortage of food never bothers a goat. A fellow can always find a square meal if he uses his head. And now, beside the trail, a sheep and goat market. One of the blue men, checking his goatskin canteen, decides he needs a new one. And he strikes a good bargain, for the new canteen has the goat still in it. The summit of the Atlas Range has at last been reached and left behind. The caravan approaches journey's end. Now it's only a matter of days to Marrakesh. But some hazards are yet to be overcome, for now nature whips up a sandstorm to torment man and beast alike. It's a saying of these Arab people that even the worst things will pass away. And when the plains are reached at last, 
the caravan comes through in good condition. From here on, all roads will lead to Marrakesh. But the blue men and their camels still prefer to travel along the stony wayside. They're not used to modern highways and teeming traffic. On these busy roads, everything's on the move, even the scenery. And of course, wherever you find heavy traffic, you'll find a hitchhiker. the outskirts of town, you'll also find a used burrow lot. Looks like they've hopped up the demonstration model. At the walls of Marrakesh, the camel drive comes to an end. Here, outside the city, the blue men pause to set up camp. Then, after a brief rest, they set out to find the camel markets. The markets are called souks, and today, as usual, trading is active. In fact, very active. According to science, there's no such thing as a wild camel, but the camel dealers are equally sure there's never been a tame one. Camel trading is just like horse trading. It takes a bit of haggling, but finally the deal is struck. And everybody's happy, except, of course, the camel. After business, pleasure. Now the blue men and their spouses set out to do the town. For the desert nomads, this will be a daring adventure into a strange new world. It's a very old world that lies behind these ancient walls. Across the narrow winding streets, Wool dyers have been hanging their wares for countless centuries. These gay festoons create strange patterns of light and shadow that seem to symbolize the dim and distant past. Here, long forgotten generations seem to live and walk again. Out of the dust of venerable byways just like these rose the great civilizations of today. And this is the miracle of Marrakesh. Surrounded by a modern world, it remains a city untouched by time. The great marketplace is a combination bazaar, midway, and super department store. To the blue men, it's all new and exciting. From the wayside shops, they can purchase everything to fill their needs a rug for the tent, or perhaps something in a new hat. And if it proves to be the right size, you just wrap it up. This was the milkman of 1000 BC. And here's the original quick lunch counter where busy merchants have been trying to find time to eat for 3,000 years. If you dropped into a barber shop a few centuries ago, you could get a shave and a haircut all for one price. And all in one place, too. Barbers, it seems, have been talking for thousands of years, continuously. Here, too, you'll find one of the world's first traveling salesmen. He sells a very precious commodity, water. And here with a glass of orange juice is the original soda jerk. But the mad whirl of the metropolis is not for the blue man of Morocco or for his mate. It's been a pleasant interlude, but in the end, they turn their backs on the luxury and comfort of city life and choose the never ending struggle for survival on the great Sahara Desert.
This, then, is Morocco's story of the past, a story of a people, a place, and a man was new.